According to the World Health Organization, two billion people may become infected with swine flu and our children may be at the highest risk. Normally 90% of flu deaths are in the elderly, 65 years and older. But with swine flu, children and young adults ages 5 through 14 are more than 10 times more likely to become infected. That means 15,000 Korean children may die. Where did this virus come from? Well, the genetic fingerprint of this virus was published this summer, and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and laboratories from around the world have confirmed that the main ancestor of the current pandemic virus was the triple hybrid mutant pig bird human virus that emerged and spread throughout industrialized farms in the United States 10 years ago. This first hybrid mutant was found on an industrial farm in North Carolina in August of 1998 that can find thousands of pregnant pigs in metal crates so small they couldn't turn around. Thanks to long-distance live animal transport, the virus then spread throughout North America. And thanks to the export of pigs to Asia, it reached Korea by 2005. This is not the first disease to emerge from factory farms. And unless we start giving these animals more breathing room, it may not be the last. For example, China. 2005, the world's largest producer of pork suffered an unprecedented outbreak of an emerging pig pathogen called strep suis, which caused meningitis and deafness in people handling infected pork products. Hundreds of people infected with the deadliest strain on record. Why? Well, the World Health Organization blames in part these intensive confinement conditions. The U.S. Department of Agriculture elaborates all strep suis seems to start out harmless, asymptomatic as normal flora, but then stress due to inadequate housing, ventilation, overcrowding allows the bug to go invasive, causing infections of the brain, blood, lungs, heart, and death. Starts out harmless, turns deadly. That's what these kind of conditions may be able to do. This is not arguably how animals were meant to live. July 2009, just a few months ago, a strain of Ebola was reported on a factory farm in the Philippines confining 6,000 pigs. It was Ebola restin, the same strain featured in the book The Hot Zone, airborne Ebola, but doesn't seem to be able to infect people, but with enough time to mutate in pigs, who knows? So they drove them into these pits and then burn them alive. We feed antibiotics by the truckload to farmed animals. This is the total amount of antibiotics used for all of human medicine every year here in the States. Now contrast that with the amount that's just fed to farm animals just to promote growth and prevent disease in such a stressful, unhygienic, crowded environment. Millions of pounds a year. And now we as physicians are faced with these multi-drug resistant, antibiotic resistant bacteria and are running out of good treatment options, particularly in pediatric populations. As Britain's chief medical officer put it in his 2009 annual report, every inappropriate use of antibiotics in agriculture is a potential death warrant for a future patient. Industrial animal farms have been shown to be breeding grounds for disease for at least 10 reasons. For example, because of the sheer numbers of animals, because of the overcrowding. It's like having you know, 5,000 people in an elevator and someone sneezes. Because of the stress crippling their immune systems. The operation in Newton Grove, North Carolina, where the ancestor of the current pandemic virus was first detected, was a breeding facility in which thousands of pregnant sows were confined in gestation crates, also known as sow stalls. These are veal crate-like uh, barren metal cages about two feet wide. These highly intelligent social animals essentially kept in a box week after week, month after month for nearly their entire lives. They can develop crippling joint deformities, lameness. Not only can these pregnant pigs not turn around, they can barely move for most 
of their lawn. Because of the lack of fresh air, the dankness helps keep the virus alive in these kind of facilities. Because there may be no sunlight. The UV rays and sunlight are actually quite effective in destroying the influenza virus. 30 minutes of direct sunlight utterly deactivates the influenza virus, but it can last for days in the shade and weeks in moist manure. And indeed, because of the decomposing fecal waste, releasing ammonia, burning the respiratory tracts of these animals, predisposing them to infection in the first place. Put these and all these other factors together, and what you have is really this kind of perfect storm environment for the emergence and spread of new so-called super strains of influenza. The public health community has been warning about the dangers of industrialized animal agriculture for years. In 2003, the American Public Health Association, the largest organization of public health professionals in the world, called for an, a moratorium on industrialized animal farming. In 2005, the United Nations called on all governments, local authorities, international agencies, told them they needed to take a greatly increased role in combating the role of factory farming, which combined with these live bird markets provide what they call ideal conditions for the virus to spread and mutate into a more dangerous form. In 2008, the Pew Commission on Industrial Farm Animal Production, which included a former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, concluded that these so-called factory farms present unacceptable public health risks. The former director of the commission calls these industrial farms super incubators for viruses. They're a public health menace that must be stopped. Only a few thousand people have died so far of swine flu, though, although one could never really call anything that's killed hundreds of children mild exactly, but this H1N1 virus hasn't been much worse than the regular seasonal flu so far, but this may just be the first wave. The 1918 flu pandemic was relatively mild first as well. Though we're not exactly sure what happened in 1918, compared to what was to come later, this first initial uh, wave in the summer of 1918 hardly registered a blip, but it came back in the fall to kill tens of millions of people. In Korea in 1918, according to the Japanese colonial government at the time, as many as 8 million Koreans died the last time an animal flu virus jumped species into human beings. Now the worst case scenario estimate would be if the swine flu were to combine with the H5N1 bird flu, both of which have been found in pigs. So if a single pig in parts of Asia or Africa where the H5N1 bird flu virus has become endemic, if that pig becomes co-infected with both swine flu and the new bird flu, the concern is that it could theoretically produce a virus with the human transmissibility of the swine flu, but the human lethality of the bird flu. In 1918, the mortality rate of the pandemic was less than 5%. This estimate here on the right, potentially tens of millions of people dead in the next pandemic, is based on this two to th same 2-3% to mortality rate, what the U.S. Centers for Disease Control calls a Category 5 pandemic, around 2% mortality, around 2 million Americans dead. So that's 2%. But H5N1 has so far killed over half of its known human victims. Don't even seem to get a coin toss as to whether or not one lives through this disease. Up to 10 million Koreans come down with the flu every year. What if it suddenly turned deadly? That's what keeps everyone up at night. The possibility, however slight, that a virus like H5N1 could trigger a pandemic. That would be like combining one of our most contagious known diseases, influenza, with one of the deadliest, like crossing a disease like Ebola with the common cold.
all animals deserve humane treatment. How we treat animals can have global public health implications, and these newly emerging chicken and pig flu viruses are but one example. We deny the modicum of mercy to both their detriment and potentially to ours as well. We need to end the long-distance live animal transport of farm animals, which can spread diseases around the world. We need to follow the Pew Commission's uh, recommendations to abolish these extreme uh, confinement practices like crates for pregnant pigs, as they're already doing in Europe and starting to here in the States. And ultimately, we need to follow the advice of the public health professionals and declare no more factory farms. Let me end with a quote from the World Health Organization. The bottom line. The bottom line is humans have to think about how they raise their animals, how they farm them, how they market them. Basically, the whole relationship between the animal kingdom and the human kingdom is coming under stress. In this age of emerging diseases, we now have billions of feathered and curly-tailed test tubes for viruses to incubate and mutate within billions more spins at pandemic roulette. Along with human culpability, though, comes hope. If changes in human behavior can cause new plagues, well then changes in human behavior may prevent them in the future. Thank you so much for your enlightening lecture, Dr. Greger. It showed us the clear link between factory farming and diseases such as swine flu. So, it's beginning to look like the vegan way of life is better, not only for climate change, but for preventing new diseases. Yes, indeed, an organic vegan diet is the true solution for a sustainable planet.